to uh, pass it off to uh, Ali Toomey uh, from Earth Echo International, and she'll get you going. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're really excited about um, doing this webinar with NYLC. I think it's a great opportunity for us. Um, before we get started, I do want to introduce our other panelists that we have with us today. Um, we have Kurt Moser, who is the Senior Program Manager for EarthForce um, in, their Washington, in the Washington, D.C. metro area. And we have Lizette, who is a middle school teacher. Um, she's a science teacher at West Miami Middle, which is in Miami-Dade County um, in their public school system. As we go through the webinar today, as Marcus noted, um, you can submit questions through the chat box. You can also tweet with us. Um, you can send us your questions using hashtag Expedition EE, because we're going to be talking about Earth Echo expeditions today. And then um, you can also be sure to tag us in the tweets if there's something that we say that sticks with you. You can always tag Earth Echo, NYLC, Earth Force, or Miami-Dade County Public Schools at MDCPS. So, um, and Hashtag Expedition EE is a great way to find out lots of different things that are going on with Earth Echo and our expeditions program. We try to tag all of our tweets with that. Um, during today's webinar, you're going to hear from me about Earth Echo as an organization. You're going to hear about our expeditions program. Um, and then you'll also hear from, then you'll hear from Lizette, and then you'll hear from Kurt. And they'll talk a little bit about how they've used Earth Echo and how their students have used some of these different Earth Echo programs. Um, we'll have a designated time for question and answer towards the end, but if you have questions, feel free to submit them as they come to you. And if I see some that correlate really well with what we're talking with about, we'll go ahead and answer those um, as we go along. So to get started, we'll tell you a little bit about Earth Echo International and who we are. We are a national nonprofit that is dedicated to empowering youth to take action that restores and protects our water planet. Earth Echo International was founded in the year 2000 by Philippe and Alexandre Cousteau, grandchildren of Jacques Cousteau, and they really had this idea that they wanted to empower youth to start protecting and preserving our planet now, not educating them for the future, but giving them the tools to do it now. Um, we've had a couple different programs. We've worked with the Warp Tour. We have a program to protect wild dolphins. Um, we had a Water Planet Challenge. We also had a stream program that is students reporting on environmental action and media. Um, and now, most recently, kind of all of that together has brought us to our expedition program, which is a really good combination of a lot of the programs that we've done in the past. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what each of those are on the next slide. But right now, the expedition that we're focusing on is into the dead zone. And then coming up in the future, we'll talk a little bit more about ocean acidification. Um, before I kind of show you what Earth Echo Expeditions is about, I'm going to show you our trailer, so the video for our trailer. Um, I'm going to let this load. I'm going to queue it up for everyone. And then I will see you when it comes back.
All right, I'll let everybody's feed just catch up for a second. Sometimes those videos take a little bit longer on different computers. Glad to hear that you enjoyed the video. Um, I think that gives a really good overview of what Earth Echo Expeditions really is all about. It gives you a really good idea of the quality of content that we're producing, but I want to tell you a little bit more about kind of the nitty gritty of it. So Earth Echo Expeditions, that was a trailer for our current expedition into the dead zone, but these are going to be yearly excursions exploring pressing environmental and ocean issues. As I mentioned earlier, we are in the process of creating our next expedition, which is going to be all about ocean acidification and the factors that lead to ocean acidification. That will become available in 2015. Um, but you're not going to lose the materials or the information from Into the Dead Zone. That's also going to be available. So we're really going to build on top of each other and create a really nice library of materials. They're exciting, engaging videos just like you saw. They're all hosted by our president and co-founder, Philippe Cousteau, Jr. Um, you follow him, our expedition team, all throughout, um, in this case, the Chesapeake Bay Watershed to explore dead zones. You're meeting experts. You're meeting scientific leaders. Um, and youth activists. We showcase and highlight a lot of youth in this video. So you get to meet students from around the country that are engaging in service learning projects and really doing positive things to better their environment. On top of this, this is really a multidimensional experience. We have our online video, but we also um, offer monthly hangouts and webinars, virtual field trips. While we're out on expedition, you can follow along through our social media and see what we're doing and where we're going, and then kind of see how that's going to translate into a video at a later point. So, um, and everything that we do, we've built around um, not only service learning, but the next generation science standards. And those are what's really coming up next in the pipeline for schools across the country, is making sure that this science is addressing big questions in science and really helping students to engage and explore on their own and not just memorizing facts. So that's a really big focal, focal point of expedition. Um, this expedition covers the dead zones. Um, it was filmed in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, but there are dead zones all over the world. Um, and if, so if you look on the map here, those little red dots, there's over 400 of them, those are dead zones that occur annually. And even though you might not live near one of those little red dots, um, water from your area probably drains to one of those areas from those little red dots. So we're really looking at issues that encompass an entire watershed and are relevant to you if you're living on a coast or if you're living in you know, the middle of the country, not even really close to any rivers. We're looking at things such as storm water wastewater, agricultural runoff, and air pollution. And those are issues that affect everyone everywhere. So they're really things that students can dive into, not just in theory, but in their own hometowns and communities. So how is Earth Echo Expeditions different? There's a lot of different resources and materials out there, but how is what we're doing different and unique? Um, we are encouraging students to explore, engage, and act. So students are exploring the outside world. They're exploring different places through all of those videos, through um, all the content that we've created and put out there on the web. Some of that is going to allow students to explore places that are far away from them. Some of that is going to help them explore places that are hit right close to home, possibly down the street. Um, to accompany all of the videos, we have student activities. And so these really allow students to engage and think critically about the issues that we presented. Um, we have a lot of lesson plans that use real scientific data. So if you really want to accompany your service learning with really robust curriculum, this is a great way to do it. And then finally, ACT. Um, the whole purpose of Earth Echo Expeditions is to not just expose students to a problem, but to get them thinking about and creating solutions to that problem for their communities, for, um, or even for our country or our globe in general. We really want students to be creating the solutions of the future. Um, we also have accompanied these videos with a lot of service learning resources. And so this is something that I know a lot of educators really ask for because they're looking for ways to get out there and do something, but they're not quite sure maybe how to do it. These resources are really going to help you out with that. Um, we have service learning videos. So in that trailer that I showed you, we saw a lot of clips from videos that um, involves youth. And those are all students that are already doing service learning 
in their communities. Each one of those student groups has a whole three minute video dedicated to just about what they're doing. Those are really inspiring to a lot of the other students that we talk to. Um, it's great to see students just like them ranging from fifth grade to college level out there doing service learning and really making an impact on their environment. Um, we also have videos that sort of explain the five stages of service learning, break them down a little bit more, um, give you some examples, more of a discussion format, that sort of thing. Um, to accompany that, we have articles that explain the five stages of service learning, student spotlights that are really inspiring, um, virtual field trips and hangouts, as I mentioned earlier. Some, like this one, are meant more for professional development purposes. Others are really aimed at classrooms. We have them during the day, and we're taking kids to new places, showing them things they've never done before. And then the last one um, that's actually up there in the middle is action guides. And I think those are some of the best resources for educators because they really take students on a journey through service. They go through all five stages of service learning, um, and they pick one issue. So we have an action guide. Our newest one is called Rain Check, and that's an action guide for stormwater management. It tells you how to examine stormwater management issues in and around your school and your community. Then it talks about different solutions and what solutions can you implement and will be best used in your community. So we have those for everything. We have one called Down the Spout. We have them um, for like water management, all sorts of different things. So our action guides are really, really a great resource for educators and students. Um, all of these resources, kind of the most important part, is where can they be found? And the best place is on our website, earthecho.org slash expeditions. Um, that's truly the best place to get all of our resources. And now that you've kind of heard a little bit about our resources um, and seen a little bit about Earth Echo Expeditions, I want to turn it over to Lizette, our educator from West Miami Middle in Miami-Dade County Public Schools. She's going to actually tell you about how her and her students have used these resources in their classroom and what they've done with it. So Lizette, I turn it over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, as Ali says, my name is Lizette Perez-Munoz. I'm a teacher here at Miami-Dade County Public Schools at West Miami Middle. And I've been involved in service learning with my students for a while now. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what my students have been able to accomplish. And I think I have to. Um, show you this PDF file. Uh, as we get to the different videos, you're going to have to give me a second so that they can upload. Um, but I do want to go through them and give you a little bit of an idea of what we do here at West Miami. So um, for time purposes, we're actually going to uh, skip this video, but we do recruitment uh, for our Ecotech Magnet, which uh, was just uh, three years old now. And it stems from all the service learning activities and everything that we've done in the school. Now, before I forget, this, all these things that we've done and that I've done with all the kids is definitely things that I need. I've needed a lot of people and a lot of help, um, not only from my colleagues and from administrators and supporters, but scientists and actual people that my students have really worked on um, or worked with alongside. And um, I understand that many of my students have had great results from the experiences that they've faced. But it all stems from what we have here in school and how they, their daily um, actions affect everything that we have around. So from there, uh, in 2007, I actually wrote a grant for Toyota, to, uh, to the Toyota company. It's, it was called the Toyota Tapestry Grant. And we got some money to start off and build three corridor Pine Rockland Gardens. Um, I actually joined efforts with scientists from Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden and FIU, and they were working on similar product, projects that actually worked in to restore habitat. So my students got the opportunity to do real life scientific work with the help of these people. Um, from then on, that same year, we also worked and have continued to work within our community, and we focused on Pine Rocklands. So I want to show you a little bit of what eco life here is in school and what our gardens were. You're going to see a lot of different dry areas that didn't um, have anything but invasive grasses, and now how they're gardens for pollinators. So I'm actually trying to upload the videos so that you could actually see them, um, this one in particular. And I'm going to 
try to get it from here. And it should be coming on pretty soon. And I think it's going to play as a video, and I believe that I'm going to be able to talk to you a little bit as it goes on. Okay, so can you hear me? Okay, well, this is one of our gardens, and this that's what was there before, and you're going to see further on how it was, or how it is now. It was dry, invasive grasses, and we just planted up over it. We also worked on restoring our pond for stormwater containment. And that was a big problem with the flood. We took care of that. Um, every year we participate in like Earth Day activities and all sorts of stuff um, throughout the year, so that my, so that the kids are involved continuously in service learning and in uh, taking action, pretty much, that to help the environment. So there you're seeing after those areas that were green are now planted when they were initially planted in 2007. And you're going to see later on in the video how much they've grown and how much they've changed. And it's great to see how they've changed because they change along with the kids. And it's a wonderful thing. So we also plant seeds inside the classroom and then propagate them and put them back into the garden or give them away to teachers for teacher appreciation days. And that's what you see there. And they're all natives, and our whole idea is to hopefully get more native plants for pollinators out into our community. There you're seeing the kids working at actual pine rocklands within our county park at A.D. Barnes and Tropical Park, um, which the kids frequent to go and play. And now there they're going and removing invasive plants from these pine rocklands to help with the, with the, with the population. We participate in competitions, and there the kids made using plants um, uh, uh, de uh, design clothing and everything else, and that was one of the competitions that we participated in, again, stemming from the work with nature and our environment and being involved with that. So we also do uh, ornithology, a little bit of ornithology. We create habitat for purple marine birds, and that's what you saw there. And that's our gardens even now. So as you can tell, they continue to grow. And we become members of uh, different organizations like Connect to Protect, we house different uh, tours and different people and all sorts of stuff. All kids guided and all the ideas um, based on the kids being involved and taking actual environmental action. So that's a competition that we did. We joined efforts with the Cincinnati Zoo and we collected over 300 cell phones for them. And then we had a gorilla and they went and they danced and you know they made a video that we uploaded into YouTube and all sorts of stuff. So the kids were really involved in, in that. It was a competition within the home room and the winning home room got the banana party and it was actually very fun. So that's just you know some of the things that we participated in. Um, from there, I want to tell you that there's been other things that you know um, I didn't, I don't actually have pictures of, but some exact projects and activities that we participated in at that scientific is. Uh, even documenting pollinators in our gardens or hand pollinating experiments. These are issues and things that other scientists within our community are working on and taking data. So we a lot of the times take data here in school and we supply the data out to our scientists so that everybody can actually you know, benefit from what we've done. Um, and really, they're really helping us, but in return, we're creating habitat that would be beneficial in helping our environment overall. We take GPS data um, with the kids and, you know, where the pollinators are and where the actual gardens are and where the actual plants are and all that. Um, we work with national parks continuously and, you know, we've done three-day environmental camping trips. We have rangers coming to the school and doing presentations and, you know, involve the kids in data collection, which, you know, we, they've done just recently and you're going to see a little bit about that in our final video with the lionfish. They were collecting data as to what the weight of the inside of the lionfish is and what they consume and all that, and the kids are really involved in all that, all those activities. Um, we've hosted rare plant society tours. The kids actually have hosted them. So it's really nice when you have a bunch of scientists and you have a bunch of kids walking them through the garden and telling them about particular plants. And, you know, it's very impressive and it's very rewarding to see that. Um, we've also had, when we've had uh, magnet recruitment, we actually bring the kids out and we plant little seeds with them, native plant seeds with them, and then they take them home. So hopefully they are also planting natives and creating small, even small habitats for our pollinators. Okay, we obviously maintain the pine roglins, 
the pond, um, which I talked a little bit about and you saw, was an actual pond that had um, koi fishes at one point. The liner broke. It was in terrible conditions. And um, what we did was that we removed the liner, since it was already broken anyway, and it does contain all the storm water that drains out from all the buildings into this pond. So what we did is we created a Cypress Dome. So the kids, um, during for an Earth Day event, and every year we add on to it, we actually have added uh, rocks to it so that we can make it more natural. We've added cypress plants, we've added aquatic plants, and everything else, and we maintain that area as a stormwater drainage, but that it looks aesthetically pleasing. Um, now, actually, tomorrow we're going to go to a field trip to Biscayne National Park for a watershed activity where we're going to be looking at the how our water is in, uh, ends up in the bay and how that has affected our mangroves. We're working on other restoration projects. On April 3rd, we're going to do a mangrove restoration where we've learned how to kayak. We've done kayaking trips, and we've learned how to kayak out, and we're going to kayak to different uh, barrier islands, and we're going to plant mangroves. Um, and then on the 9th, we actually have a, an, an Earth Day event at our zoo to restore the second largest pine rockland um, that we have outside of Everglades National Park. So all of these are different events and different activities, and it's just allowing the kids to have the opportunities to participate in these things. And it's great because once you create these, um, I guess, relationships with people, they contact us pretty much and they tell us, hey, we need kids to do this. And they're all great opportunities, you know, um, for, for students and for kids at all ages. So um, sometimes it does require some materials from class. And then this is an example of what we did because we're growing mangroves here in class. And this is one of the resources that I pretty much came up with. And uh, it's re for the restoring of the mangroves. I had the kids learn about mangroves, and we had somebody come in and talk to us about the mangroves. And we are growing mangrove propagules. If you can see here, that's what you see in our grow lamp in the back. Okay? They're growing under different conditions. So we're experimenting, and we're looking at what are the best growing conditions, and what can we do you know, to make the mangroves grow faster. And you know. And then eventually those mangroves are going to be mangroves that are going to be planted and put back into the bay and hopefully, you know, have a beneficial use to them. And the kids are directly involved with that. On April the 3rd, we're planting other mangroves because ours aren't big enough. But, you know, it's that kind of work that we hope to do with the kids. Um, so, of course, as a supplement, we do, I definitely use the Earth Echo um, materials and especially the expeditions. And the way that I've used them is that I enjoy, I like the fact that the kids are getting a broader view and that they're seeing everything that is happening in other places and how it relates to us here. So what I do is I watch the videos, I preview them, and aside from previewing them, I go ahead and I, you know, put in questions and things that I want my kids to be involved with and see. So I ask them questions and then I have it as a discussion and then they're there to answer, you know, the, the, my questions based on whatever they saw and how it relates to us. So, you know, you may not necessarily, I don't know if you can actually see it, but like for example, here on three it says, um, many water sources, including Everglades, are accustomed to low levels of nutrients known as oligotrophic. Um, how do you think having the nutrient levels known as eutrophic affects natural areas such as the Everglades? So this was based on the nitrogen uh, Earth Echo expedition that, that's on the website. And, you know, there I stemmed it from uh, the nitri high nitrogen levels to oligotrophic and eutrophic and our Everglades and how it relates to something that we have here. So I think that's important that the kids can actually learn content as well as understand and see what, in fact, how it relates to other places, not just us. So was that, can I just jump in there for a minute? Um, with that worksheet, I think that that's great that you've taken it and really taken what's in the videos and made it really useful um, and relevant to your area. But in addition to that, I do want to point out that on our website, we also have um, worksheets and activities that your students can use to follow along with the videos, too. So um, if you're out there and you're thinking, I don't have time to make a worksheet or something like that, um, we do have that, and we do have our own in addition. But Lizette is one of those teachers that always goes above and beyond. So she's doing a great job to really make it even more relevant to her students. Thank you. 
Um, so here, this was a lionfish awareness project that the kids did. Um, they actually made, um, the lionfish is a huge problem for most of the Caribbean, and the kids learned about it. They did the lionfish dissection. They collected the data through Biscayne National Park. And one of the things that, you know, we came up with, or the kids came up with, was coming up with a recipe book to try to encourage and get more people to go ahead and hunt them and, you know, use them as food. So that's an example of that. And then... I believe that this is our last slide, and this would be the service learning at West Miami. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to upload that so you guys could see, you know, some of the other things that our kids have done as far as service learning. And I want to make sure that I want to see if you guys are able to actually see it. So 
Um, as you saw, we even had a, our, the special guest of Philippe Cousteau come in and, you know, talk to the kids, and the kids were very excited because, it, you know, they got a lot out of it, and they really enjoyed being recognized for their work. And not that they, you know, don't enjoy it, but it was very nice to actually have that. And we planted uh, two trees. We planted a, an endangered amorpha and a pinus aliaria, a pine tree, while he was here. So the kids were excited. That was their idea, and they wanted it was funny because they said, we want to see his, his planting skills. So that was very cute um, for the kids. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn it back to Ali. And thank you. Thanks, everybody, for listening to me. And I hope that it was helpful. Thank you so much, Lizette. Um, and that's a great point. You know, students really do love a little bit of recognition, but also these videos that you guys have made are a really great opportunity for students to share what they've learned with other students. And that's really what a lot of Earth Echo Expeditions is about, is students being able to share what they've learned. And one group that shared what they learned really well with us um, were students from Earth Force. And Kurt Moser is going to talk a little bit about his work with Earth Force and how he's seen his students interact with um, Earth Echo Expeditions. So Kurt, I'm turning it over to you. All right. Thanks, Allie. I hope everybody can hear me, and I'm going to switch, if I can, here to my slide material. There we go. So um, just a real quick bit about Earth Force and, uh, and who we are. We're an organization that really looks to um, engage young people as active citizens, as leaders today um, who are improving the environment, um, as well as in the future. And, um, and this is sort of our, our mission statement here. Um, and the focus of our work is really around building partnerships in communities to support that kind of, uh, those kind of opportunities for youth. Um, so these are a few of the partners that we have kind of in the mid-Atlantic uh, area uh, close by to me. Um, but we try to get a diversity of partners from the private sector, from um, universities, from nonprofits, and uh, educational institutions, um, as well as formal and informal educational institutions to really give kids a voice in making things happen good for the environment in their community. Um, we also provide sort of in, in the direct way, we support the adults who support the youth doing this. So we do professional development for educators. Um, and we have resources for them, um, curriculum, um, various, uh, various iterations of curriculum that all focus on a six-step service learning process. Um, and I'll go quickly through the, the six-step process um, and just say uh, right from the get-go that um, usually our process is kind of done within a context that is uh, we may be focusing on watersheds, or we may be focusing on energy, or on health. Um, and so the process is something that usually takes place within a, a context, and kids do a very youth-driven uh, investigation. So our first step in the process is a community environmental inventory, and that's really looking at you know, what are the conditions of the environment, what is, what is going on in the community, and what does it look like. So very typically, um, locally around here, we have a lot of programming around water. Um, we have a very nice program called Caring for Our Watersheds that's very watershed focused. So a lot of what kids do is they go out and they explore in their local stream, um, or they explore on the school grounds and try to understand the stream chemistry or uh, what the, the aquatic community in the stream is. So a couple of the pictures here just show students who are um, examining conditions in a local stream, testing things like dissolved oxygen. Um, in the second step, they, they take the data that they've collected and they try to identify what are some of the issues that they notice out of their data. And sometimes it's not directly out of the data. Sometimes it's just out of the, um, their experience. Um, and they may have observed something that wasn't necessarily what they set out to collect, but it informs their perspective. Um, they choose an issue via a democratic decision-making process, and those issues typically range um, when we're talking about watersheds. There are things like bacterial contamination or low oxygen um, or other kinds of pollutants of concern. Um, in the third step, they have, once they've chosen an issue this way, they really focus in on 
their issue and what's behind it. So they do more research. And the picture that I have here um, is an, uh, an additional assessment that a group did in Arlington um, to determine what the percentage of impervious surface in their neighborhood was. So in the picture is the school, and they've shaded in all the areas that are impervious, so rooftops and roads and other things. Um, at the same time, they try to understand what is going on in the community around it. Are there laws that pertain to it? Are there community practices that are involved? Um, and they try to address a specific policy or a practice when they go into the uh, later stages of their process. So in the, the fourth step, the goal and strategy selection, they have identified a policy or a practice that they want to change. And then they decide what they're going to do about it. And again, this is democratic decision making. It's decision making based on criteria. Um, they're not just sort of making a quick uh, choice, but they're trying to uh, evaluate very well their options and what they might do as a strategy to make what they want to have happen. Um, in the fifth step, they really just take action. So the pictures here show a project in Alexandria at George Washington Middle School last year um, that built an organic garden at school. Um, and they were, wanted to be able to show the benefits of organic gardening and um, have a better grasp of it, knowing that the Chesapeake Bay itself has um, issues of nutrient, um, nutrient loading and eutrophication. Um, a critical step is really the sharing, celebrating, and showing that they have an idea of what they've learned and what they want to accomplish. Um, and we have lots of ways of doing that. And um, one of the things that was really great, as Ali mentioned, was uh, we had a group that had done Caring for Our Watersheds last year and had done Earth Force process. And part of their service learning um, effort was they wanted to film videos that showed people how to do water monitoring. Well, this lent itself very well to the Earth Echo Expedition video that talked about how to measure dissolved oxygen, how to test water quality. So um, a couple of the students from last year and a few students that were starting their process this year came out to do a video in a local stream for mile run. Um, we also have uh, events, youth summits um, that take place later in the year that are really celebrations of what students have accomplished. Um, and so we've got um, a couple of the pictures here from the youth summits that we've had where kids really get to show what they think is important and demonstrate what they're able to do. Really, ultimately, um, what's important to us is that youth really drive the process um, and that they're working with adults. It's not they're driving the process alone. Um, and we're trying to get them to be active citizens. Um, we look at this as environmental action civics and critical to developing a leadership base among youth now um, and a leadership base for the future in the environment. So, Ali, Great. I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, thanks so much, Kurt. And I think um, one of the points that he had about his students that were actually able to participate in an Earth Echo video, um, the really nice thing was that we had students that had completed their Earth Force project from the year before, and then those students that were just starting out. So the students that were just starting out kind of got a, a sneak peek of what had been done the year before. And now this year, they've been able to supplement all of their Earth Force projects with those Earth Echo Expeditions materials that we have online. So they've been able to really explore those issues and use those resources. And um, we are running short on time, so I am just going to jump ahead to questions. I know we have um, one question that keeps popping up, and I was wondering if um, both Kurt and Lizette could just kind of speak to this a little bit. One thing that a lot of educators always ask is, or the one complaint we hear from them is that they don't have time and they're worried about liability. So um, how can, you, can you guys address how you deal with like either liability issues and time issues outside of the classroom when service learning? Why don't we start with Lizette? Was that? Are you there? Are you on mute? Hear me? Hear that better? Yeah, there we go. We can hear you now. All right. Um, so liability is always an issue, definitely. But you know, as long as we do everything that is required by you know risk management and our uh, county, 
liability is pretty much taken care of. Yes, our kids are in the water. Yes, they have to be swim tested. Yes, it happens once a year. All these things, but you know, and all, it, not only does it protect the the school board, but it also protects me. So it's important that all those things do get taken care of, and the rewards are huge when it comes to actually being able to take these kids and do the different things. I've done snorkeling. I do kayaking throughout the year. Tomorrow we're doing canoeing. So all of these things, yes, they are a lot of liability. Yes, they're a lot of work. Yes, they require a lot of extra time, but they're so rewarding and our kids really get so much out of them that to me, it's essential. Those aren't things that I can actually teach inside a classroom. So for me, the, the, the outcome outweighs the liability and all the extra time and everything else. Great point, Lizette. I think that, you know, taking the time to take a few extra steps can really result in that huge reward. Kurt, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would just add that the, um, I think the liability question is a good one, but I don't think the liability question is really any different from the liability question you would have for any field trip, um, whether that was a museum or a science center or anywhere. Um, that there's always that question, and, and I think that Planning is the key, um, making sure that there are, you know, as in any field trip, an appropriate number of adults with them, a first aid kit, the emergency info on hand, permission slips, and everything else. I mean, that's, that's fairly normal. It, it shouldn't be any different. Um, it's a different setting, but it's not, the issues are not really that different. And I, and I would add that if liability is truly a sticking point, um, I think that's a really, um, important stage at which to look at what opportunities there are on campus. Um, we have a lot of students who will start their inventories by looking around the schoolyard. They'll examine what are the stormwater issues, or they'll do an energy inventory in the school building. And those are things that, again, if liability was, you know, such an insurmountable obstacle, you can do that in the school. And one of the great things about the Earth Echo materials is it helps you to tie that to what's going on elsewhere. I think that's a great point as well, Kurt. A lot of our action guides that we have, and I know, um, are set up to really start at the school. Um, they can definitely go out and do things like monitor permeable versus impermeable surfaces and stormwater issues in the entire community, but you can start at the school, and I think that um, pointing out to students that even your school can make a difference, you know, by doing little things, I think that that is a great, a great point and a great place to start if you're not quite ready to jump out of the classroom just yet. Um, another question that we got was about the worksheets. And so I'm going to actually share my, um, or the Earth Echo worksheet that we have. I just pulled it up on the computer. We have worksheets to accompany each of our um, videos, our issue videos. So the one that I'm going to pull up, let's see, it is sharing. Give me just a second. Okay, so this is um, what our typical video worksheet looks like. It needs to accompany our issue videos, those main videos that we have on our website. They're about eight minutes long, and each one of them covers a topic. The first one is what is a dead zone. Then we deal with stormwater, permeable versus impermeable surfaces. We deal with wastewater issues in one video. We deal with um, agricultural issues, which is where Lizette was talking about the nitrogen cycle and that sort of thing. And then we also do with air, deal with air pollution in another one. Um, and that, and um, the stormwater one deals with the water cycle. So there's lots of different curriculum ties in these. And we try and come up with worksheets that first have students begin to think about the um, vocabulary that they're going to hear in the videos. So they can start thinking about what some of these words may mean before and then after the videos. And then with that, we also have um, questions that, and these are tailored to the videos. So Lizette kind of took this along with her knowledge of her local Miami area and combined that into her own worksheet that not only pointed out things in the video, but then tied that back to the Miami area. So I think that um, there's a lot of creative things that you can do with it, and we have no problem with you taking some of our questions, adding some of your own, mixing and matching, or anything like that. I think that that is a really great initiative for Lizette to take. Um, let me just look in here in the chat if we have anything else. Do you have any reflections as educators about things that you would do differently in the future? 
Um, Lizette or Kurt, do any of you want to share maybe some lessons learned, some things that you would have done differently if you had the chance? Um, I think that if I had the opportunity, um, I would probably try to open it up to more students and more kids. Um, a lot of the times I find that uh, the kids that are involved with me are generally the ones that benefit most of the time. And, you know, it's harder to get, you know, other colleagues and other people because, unfortunately, it is true. You know, everybody is busy and everybody doesn't have the background knowledge or, you know, the experience or even the you know, the ability to be able to do all the extra things. So um, I think that it's great that now we have the Ecotech Magnet, so now I can involve more kids. And I think that that's one of the positive things that we're heading towards. And I don't know if I would have done things differently, but I know that I'm heading in a different direction where I'm trying to involve more kids and, you know, more people that, you know, show interest. And I think that that's where I'm heading in a... In a different way, I guess. Great. And I know one thing that I hear from educators a lot when we're working with them is um, it does seem like a lot to really dive into service learning and get your kids outside of the classroom, but it's okay to start small, and it's okay to start with those small steps. I mean, even you guys at West Miami Middle started with smaller projects, and everything has kind of grown since then. So it's okay to start small. I think that that's probably the best advice that we can give to educators out there. Um, yeah. I just want to leave you guys with one. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Kurt. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to sort of say I, I agree with that, and I think that, that one of the things, I mean, I, I, I work with many different educators, and they are the ones who do the direct work with the students. Um, I think what is interesting is that a lot of educators feel a little hesitant about really allowing youth voice to come through. Mm -hmm. um, but what they find when they do, and I think probably a lot of folks, when they look back, they see this, what they find is when they do, the kids take real ownership of the issue and the, and the environmental questions and the solutions. And when they do that, that's really when they become effective and that's when they get the most out of it. The learning is best promoted when kids feel like it's theirs. Um, when they feel like their teacher told them they had to build a rain garden, that's not as strong for them. It doesn't last with them. When they feel like they have to advocate, their teacher says, well, I think you should build a rain garden, and they say, no, we think we should do this. Even if the idea is far-fetched, when they own that, it means so much more to them. So I think, to me, that would be the reflection that I would share. Yeah, and I think I think that that's a really great point, too, and I think that that's when students are truly transformed, like you said, and really take that to heart is when they do have that youth voice um, influence into what they're doing. So we are running a little long, so I just want to leave everyone with a couple last points. Um, my coworkers Stacy and I are going to be presenting at the monumental um, National Service Learning Conference, which is in Washington, D.C., this April 9th through the 12th. So if you're coming, come and check us out. We are presenting a workshop um, called Adventure Learning with Earth Echo Expeditions, and that's going to be April 10th at 4 p.m. So and you can go ahead and mark your calendars, and get, you can get more information on servicelearningconference.org. That's where all of that information is. And in addition to that, um, please feel free to follow us on all of our social media sites. We recently started an Edmodo community, just so educators can ask these questions and get them answered. It's a really great place for educators to go, where it's just you guys, and you can talk about the troubles you're having with your classes, the things you want to do differently, anything like that, and we will jump in and help um, and facilitate some of those conversations. And then, of course, I just want to leave you one last time with our website, earthecho.org slash expeditions. That's where you can find all of our resources. Um, and I just want to say thank you to Marcus from NYLC for having us on today and to Kurt and Lizette for being wonderful panelists and hopefully answering all of your questions. So thank you very much, everybody. It's been great. Um, please contact us if you have any questions. Thanks, Sally. Bye. Thank you. Bye, all. Bye.